Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Episode 43 of Season 1 of 40 Watt Podcast. I am your host, Philip, as usual, taking care of the housekeeping stuff here at the top of the show. Y'all be sure to go over to 40wattpodcast.com where you can find all the show notes. Well, most of the show notes. I think I'm a couple of weeks behind. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, you can go over there. You can find all of our links. You can find uh, our social media. You can find the Facebooks and the YouTubes and the Twitter and the Instagram and there's something else I don't even remember anymore. There's too much social media in my life. Um, you can also go to our Linktree account. I haven't mentioned that in a while. Linktr.ee slash 40 watt podcast, um, where you can also find all those links. You can find my reverb affiliate link where you can go create a reverb account. You can buy stuff there and at no cost to you, I get a little bit of a kickback and it helps keep this show going and cover some of the overhead costs. Um, turns out podcasting isn't free. We've talked about that before. Uh, you've heard me rant about it, but, uh, if you do want to support the show, let's talk about how you can do that real fast. Free way. You can tell your friends about the show. You can tell your enemies about the show. You can tell your family about the show. You can tell complete strangers about the show, have them tune in, check it out. Even if they listen to it and it turns out not to be their thing, that's totally okay. Um, Second of all, you can rate, review, like, subscribe, comment, thumbs up, thumbs down. YouTube algorithm doesn't really care one way or the other, um, but please thumbs up. That'd be great. Um, and those are all free ways you can help the show. Now, if you are of the giving nature, uh, you can go over to Patreon over at patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast for as little as $3 a month. You can help keep this show going. Uh, help me cover some of these overhead costs, things like uh, podcast hosting and the editing software that I use to edit the videos. And if you've seen some of my video edits, you might think I need some lessons in that as well. Um, and you can pay for that. Um, for $5 a month, you actually get an extra episode every week. That's twice the content for five bucks a month. That's a lot of extra content. For example, two weeks ago, the uh, Patreon episode went for two hours and 15 minutes. That's a lot of extra. Ep that's like two more extra episodes that week. That's way more than usual. So you never know what you're going to get. The Patreon episodes where the jam is. I really appreciate all of you that are, uh, that are patrons and are supporting the show. This episode happens. These, these shows happen because of you. And I appreciate it. And remember, at the end of every season, so at the end of every year, I take 25% of my Patreon proceeds and I donate them to charity. Uh, this year's charity is going to be St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and last episode of the year, I haven't decided exactly which one that's going to be. My guess is going to be the, the Thursday before Christmas will be the last episode of this season, end of the year. Uh, and then that next week, I'll total up the proceeds from this year and I'll, I'll be writing that check or I don't know, putting my credit card information into St. Jude and <laughs> donating that money. So, uh, gotten through everything. That's the spiel. I appreciate all the support. We're going to move on to this week's episode because I'm super pumped about this one. I'm going to do my very best not to just talk the, this entire episode about purple glitter finishes. <laughs> I swear to God, it's, I'm not going to do it. But I've got Doug Cower of Cower Guitars. How oh, good, man? How about you? I am fantastic. I'm I'm having a good day. I'm I'm drinking coffee at you know yes. nine o'clock at night. You know how that is. Well, uh, <laughs> I will say if you want to talk about purple glitter, that's fine. Uh, the caveat to that is every clothing garment in my house has purple glitter on it now. Uh, <laughs> I think I might not have shaken a pair of pants off from spraying uh, before putting them in the wash fast enough or well enough and. Oh, yeah, no. it's like the manly ver metal flake is just manly version of uh, uh, glitter. You know, it, it's just it's just yeah. as contagious. It's it's like scabies of a plastic version. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> stuff's everywhere. My wife is very kindly <laughs> trying to blame it on an outfit of my daughter's, but I'm I know where it came from. <laughs> yeah, you know, she knew what this was. She knows what's going on here. <laughs> the worst is uh, no, it's. The paint we spray, uh, it's a UV cure finish, so it doesn't dry unless you put it out in the sun or in the, the special booth we have. So my shoes are always sticky, and they're always covered in glitter. <laughs> and so every time I go to pick up my kids from school, I have to reiterate that I build guitars for a living, and I don't work at a strip club. Uh, <laughs> it's it's real bad. Uh, there's a lot of like, oh, yeah. It could just be... 
You can just say a Michaels. You, we yeah. work at a Michaels. It's fine. <laughs> It's it's the old fashioned and and listeners you'll have to forgive me. Uh, you know everyone says glitter is the herpes of the craft yeah. world. Um, once one person's got it, they just start sharing yeah. it, and you never yep, get rid that's of it. Exactly it. It's always there. <laughs> <laughs> so Doug, you make you make some pretty incredible Thank guitars, you. and so you're based you're based yep. in California. You're gonna have to tell me exactly where in California. I'm gonna be really honest. I I tried to research for this episode. I really wanted to like do my yep. background and do my do my Digging in, and like I was going to tell you things about you that you forgot you knew about you. No, I got sidetracked. I just kept looking at pictures That's of banshees. Fine. So we're in uh, uh, Elk Grove, technically, is where the shop is at. It's uh, just south of Sacramento. It's like the, I mean, I live in Sacramento. I cross the street and I'm back in Elk Grove now. It's it's just one of those suburbs. Oh, wow. uh, so the shop's been there. Oh man, I mean, I grew up in the family business, so I've been through from the garage to Dad's first shop, which was a uh, ice house. An old ice house in Lodi, which is significantly south of us. Uh, that place was awesome. Uh, and then it was like, I mean, a literal ice house built on the railroad line. Uh, the walls were like three feet thick, stayed the exact same temperature year round. Uh, it was cool. Oh, uh, wow. And then uh, I think we're in our fifth shop now, hopefully our last. Uh, it's, I, I, yeah, uh, we've, we've moved, you know, between my dad's business and then now he's kind of segued out retiring. Uh, and then my business that kind of came over and took over it or shifted. Uh, yeah, I've, I've done moving. We, we, we've been came into the spot in 2001 and I hope that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've been pretty settled in there for over, over yeah. like 20 years now. Yeah, so we, you're, you're pretty we've been on the there. same block actually for almost 30 years. Uh, so we, our shop oh, wow. went from like a single, you know, it's like the, little commercial zone of, of our, of Elk Grove on the, on our side of town. And so we went from like 1500 feet to 3000 feet to 6,500 feet. No, I'm sorry to 9,500 feet. Then back down to 6,500 feet. Uh, when the, uh, recession hit, uh, back in like 08, we, 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 we had like a third spot that was kind of storage and, and mostly dad's toys, his boat and stuff, but was also, uh, where we were like staging jobs and stuff and, and just didn't make sense that, you know, when everything kind of fell out, uh, I wish we had it back now cause we're just tripping over each other with stuff. Uh, but I don't really want the 20 or, uh, 15 years later rent price. So <laughs> we're still in two units. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I've got, actually, I've got a really good friend of mine. Cody lives over in, in Sacramento works with the arts and oh, music sure. over there. And he, um, yeah, we, we have talked about <laughs> the the cost of rent and where he is, yeah. and he had a studio at one point, and just the cost of having that studio there. Just in, I I know that especially, in, you know, I live in Mississippi, mm-hmm. so I'm <laughs> anytime anybody wants to talk about real estate yeah. prices, I'm like, <laughs> I will I will just depress you. I will completely depress you. It's like I had a a friend of mine. Uh, she was in, oh, where was she? She was somewhere in the Bay ish yeah. area. Not yeah, she's you know, ish. We're gonna she's a little outskirts, smaller town, but um she sold her house there and moved to Washington mm-hmm. and she was she told me how much she got and she had like a third of an acre and like seventeen hundred square yeah. feet. And she told me how much she got, and I'm not gonna date this show by telling the number, just get someone comes down back late years later. But I will say that for the price she told me, I said in Mississippi, and I pulled up a listing, I said, I can get you sixty yeah. acres, fifty four hundred square feet, ten bedrooms. Well that's what I mean, that's <laughs> like, what happened to our town. So I mean, this is a whole diversion here, but so my parents are from Mountain mm-hmm. View. So that like, you know, right. my my uh, grandmother's house, you know, was a little junky house in Menlo Park that now is across the freeway from Facebook's campus. Like it, you know, they're from there and they moved to oh. Elk Grove in 1980 because they couldn't afford the Bay Area in 1980. Uh, and I, I remember when uh, we bought, my wife and I bought our first house, I don't know, 15 years ago, whatever, long time ago. And uh, we were talking to my grandpa and, uh, I was like, yeah, you know, it's, you know, $300,000 house and, you know, that's going to be tight, but we'll make it work. It's like, yeah, when we bought this house in 1964, it was $32,000 and I never knew how we'd afford it. 
and it sold for two point one million like two years ago. You know, I'm like, yeah, it's just yeah. it's just insane. It, it, it's it's tough. Yeah. Uh, trying to think. Uh, I wonder if I know Cody. Uh, what's his last name? Okay, Anthony. Cody. There Anthony. was a may or may did not. Did he have a music studio at one point? He did. Uh, I don't know how like fully like commercially operational sure. they had gotten. I know they had done some small project stuff and. And some stuff happened with they. They ended up having to move out sure. of there, but um, we used to have a, a full wife... recording studio in our complex. Not us, me personally, but somebody else did. Oh wow! I, man, I'm blanking on the name of the guy who owned it, but it's that same boat. Like the rent just got so outrageous that you know you can't have a yeah. three thousand square foot commercial space without hustling. <laughs> yeah, you better you better be really bringing in the business at that point because yeah, yeah, it's it's it's. Yeah, I, you know, you see it, and it's happening all over. You know, it's rents going yeah. up everywhere, and and not just rent, but just real estate prices. But that's for we'll, sure. we'll get off the real estate podcast because I I will I will go down it's this rabbit California hole. California thing, man. And that's all it, we talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, man. So, uh, I'm going to backtrack yeah. just a little. So, you talked about the family business. So, when you say family business, your dad made nope, guitars he's as well. A cabinet maker. Yep. Cabinet maker. Yeah. Okay. He. That's what I was wondering if you just meant woodworking or if you yeah, meant actual no, he, guitar making. Yeah, he uh, actually he went to school um, through automotive college, and then he was a parts manager for Stockton Dotson at the time. Became Nissan uh, while he was there, uh, and then he got into doing. Uh, actually, he didn't get into woodwork. He got into messing around with this certain tool called a shopsmith, and a shopsmith was like the nineteen fifties. Swiss Army knife for the hobbyist woodworker. It's basically a drill press <laughs> that you can, uh, you know, raise to be a vertical drill press. You can lay it flat uh, to be a horizontal boring machine. But they also had like a, a basically a variable transmission, continuously variable transmission. So you could run the speed up and down without having to like change the belts on a drill press. You just crank the wheel and it speeds up and down. So they made like oh. a router attachment. And a table saw attachment and all these things and it was like you know buy the shopsmith and all the accessories and you can make anything and it's a phenomenal drill press amazing drill press absolutely terrifying table saw i don't know who ever <laughs> used it as a table saw and didn't get killed like it's i, I have a picture from the original 50s court, like uh man you know, like manual sales brochure and it shows the, I, i'll have to send it to you off after the fact it shows yeah. this thing like you can use it as a table saw, and the guy's running a piece across. Or you can use it as a vertical saw, and it's literally this dude bear hugging a four by eight sheet of material while he's dragging it across this thing with a saw blade <laughs> at neck level, just running horizontal. It's like the French revolutionaries would have dreamed to own this machine. It would have been like gu electric guillotine. It's the most amazing photo I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, it's like a you know, like a like a cartoon brochure style, but I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No it's drawn, being but on Earth, because you couldn't get no, a real person no, to do that it. That was the yeah. most insane thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but he got into building those things. It's, it's essentially a mid century, mid century yeah, Dremel, yeah, just yeah, higher that's, power. You know, six feet long and and weighs a hundred pounds, and uh, but they're amazing machines. They, they're you know, I have it's it's a whole thing here. So he got into restoring those. I don't know if someone gave him one. Uh, you know, Shanghai Shopsmith is still in business today. I don't know how, um, but they are. And like, but he got one because I've never seen one that's newer than like 1965. Like everybody's grandfathers at this point owned them, and now no one knows what to do with them. Which is why I have like seven of them now <laughs> because people are like, "Oh, I oh have one in my garage. Do you want it?" I'm like, "Yeah, I do actually. I do want it." Uh, <laughs> you know. So, but he got into messing with those, and then he started making wood things on it for I think just for me and my brother when we were little 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 kids like I mean babies basically and then he got into doing cabinets in like furniture for people in the neighborhood and then it went on from there and um, like I have a picture of me at I can't be more than six uh catching uh crown molding coming out of the molder in our garage like my dad's 72 blazer oh, is wow. in the driveway uh you know and the lawns still look nice and <laughs> like it's <laughs> yeah, you know, it was it was a nice. I mean, yeah. The floorboards yeah, haven't rusted like out yet. Yeah, looked better than it maybe did when I'm, you know, later on. But uh, yeah, and so I I grew up sure. doing that with him, and then I just got into, you know, I played guitar, 
uh, always messed with everything. I built cars my whole life. I've, you know, whatever hobby I got into, if it could be disassembled, reassembled, broken, put together incorrectly, I did it at some point, you know, and, and, uh, so eventually just guitar building kind of came around as a, you know, again, during the recession, when there wasn't that much cabinet work to do, uh, I just right. kind of got into it to pass the time. And my, my father-in-law, uh, he did like light repair work. Like he knew how to do frets and levels and crowns and guitar wiring and like, which the wiring part I knew how to do, but like some of the stuff that I didn't really know how, and I just got into it. And then I met people in the business. I had no idea there was a boutique guitar industry. This is like 2007, 2008. Um, you know, and, and, uh, well, I think I started kind of building in like 2005, six. And then by 2008, I was doing original work and, you know, met Nick Huber, met you over Congress, met a bunch of guys in, and, you know, yeah. the, uh, on the electric side back then, there wasn't really any women that I knew about, knew at the time. It's a different thing now. But, like, they were super encouraging, and the I designed the Daylighter as just something for fun uh, for me, and people liked it. And like an idiot, here I am. Uh, <laughs> I had a real job. <laughs> Couldn't stop doing it then. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because you said, you know, back then, uh, the boutique guitar industry. So I started playing guitar in 1999. Sure. Um well, te- technically, I had, a f- I had a false start playing guitar back in, like, 95. Until I I did something to piss my sister off, and she Ooh. smashed the pawn shop acoustic guitar that I had. And so, yeah, yes. didn't get that replaced until I, <laughs> yeah, what, I don't know what I did. Honestly, it, I could have just done anything, you know, because she, she, was, she was prone to getting mad at me anyway. Um, older brother, yep. younger sister, the whole nine yards. But so I finally got another guitar my senior year of high school and really started to learn to play. And I got I got really into playing, really, really, you know, pushed myself playing as fast as I could because I thought I was sure. behind because I was 18. You know, I heard everybody's like, oh, I started when I was three yeah. and a half. Or, <laughs> yeah. You know, something ridiculous. Um, Some ridiculous. Oh, well, you know, I picked up my, my dad's guitar when I was seven. I was like, mm. what? It was bigger than you. <laughs> so, um. I, I I played really, really hard and then went to college, started playing guitar even more. Then I moved to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, went to college there to learn sure. recording industry and audio engineering. And that's when I started to really get into gear because suddenly I was in a world that had a mm-hmm. ton of gear. And so, like, 2004, I moved back to Mississippi. And back then, like, boutique guitar, like, okay, Anderson existed. Yeah. And... You know, you know, and that was about yeah. it to me. I was like, I don't know who else is boutique. Taylor at this was point. boutique to me, um, you know, it, back then. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so, and there's been an absolute explosion since then. And now, you you can't throw a rock without hitting a boutique mm-hmm. builder. So when when boutique builders start to really stand out to me, that's when I really start paying attention. And I I rue the day I found your Instagram, <laughs> um, because. Jesus. Did you land? Did you so, land on uh, we're gonna talk about that. Choke Day or was it actually a Guitar Day? Uh. <laughs> no, it was actually a Guitar Day. Um, uh, you 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 reeled me in with the Guitar Day, then you then you hooked me like I was stuck with yep. Big Joke Day. Um, but no, <laughs> it's um, uh, I actually I remember distinct, and it's this is your your guitars are real new to I mean really sure. new to me. I I've told the story a few times on the podcast how I. You know, I grew up playing, I was playing in Mississippi, I was playing blues mm-hmm. bars with a bunch of old blues bands, and I was playing a Strat or a, you know, semi-hollow sure. body yeah. uh, through a Fender yep. amp uh, with the same four or five pedals for yep. 10 years. Absolutely. And and then all of a sudden, one day, I saw a friend of mine selling a pedal I'd never heard of, and I was like, what? I'd never heard of that. And then all of a sudden, I decided to start kind of like looking, and there were boutique amps and guitars and pedals. This is like 2016 ish for me. Um, and then, um, in the last two years, I discovered yours. And the one that really like got me, like the first time I really, like really paid attention, it was this, uh, red Banshee with black racing stripes and you had it on the back Mm -hmm. of the truck. And I just looked at that and I was like, that is the hot rod (laughs) car. guitars. That's, that's, that is absolutely the GTO sure. of boutique guitars I've ever too. seen. And so I've been hooked 
Yeah, it's it's. Well, you know, there's something about it. Sorry. Uh, Oh no, no, please go uh, ahead. Sorry, the GTO thing, uh, especially. So Banshee is the original name for the Pontiac Firebird. I used to restore first gen Firebirds. I was a Pontiac guy. Uh, Yeah, I know I have the the '64 Chevy, uh, which is because it was my grandfather's and his family and stuff. But I grew up restoring Pontiacs, and so yeah, that was the yeah the GTO thing. I actually. Okay, ironically, it came down to, for my first car, because um, we used to restore Firebirds, but I was almost a 68 GTO uh, that a friend of ours had, but it was Verdero Green, which is a color that I hated, I still hate on cars, <laughs> hate. GM must have gotten the deal of the yeah. century on that color, because they painted just <laughs> everything that green, which is ironic, because on a guitar, yeah. actually, we've been using it lately, and I really like it, but... When you when you take it down to about two square feet, the color is great. When you put it on a hundred square feet, <laughs> it's, fine. it's too much. It's just awful. That's yeah, a whole lot of but green. But it was like, it was one of those things. And I then I found my Firebird instead. I had a '69 Firebird, uh, and that was the car I wanted instead. Which makes me sound really entitled. But I also spent four years building that car, uh, and it kept me out of a lot of trouble. Amazingly, which is again a big diversion here. But uh, yeah, I. I oh, yeah. Uh, the the banshee with the strike we've been doing a lot of those lately we have one dealer that really kind of yeah. uh has hit run with those um ironically i think that red one is uh no we have another one that's at the i have a whole bunch of them at the shop that are stuck because we've been waiting on a container ship full of our cases from mono to get into port for the last oh, oh yeah it's no. been a thing <laughs> it's been a whole there's a whole <sighs> whole bunch of that to discuss but uh uh yeah well i appreciate that we you know it's funny i think we might be about the same age and about started playing guitar around the same time then uh because i started playing in let's see okay i learned bass in eighth grade Uh, i had no musical hope like no talent uh i wanted (laughs) guitar lessons growing up my whole life because my dad played guitar my parents always told me if you get good grades we'll get you guitar lessons uh so i gave up and taught myself how to play guitar uh basically over the summer between junior high and high school and the whole reason i switched from bass to guitar uh was the guy that i was friends with um so i uh the saving grace to the story is i went to the greatest possible middle school for someone who always wished he could play music but never knew how uh and wouldn't get grades so that he could get lessons uh we had a phenomenal music program uh at my junior high and high school uh, so awesome. I learned to play trombone there, and then the buddy that I sat next to um, started playing bass, and I started playing bass, and I thought, well, they don't need two bass players. The world just doesn't need that. Uh, it definitely needs another guitar player. Um, and I had a guitar, and he didn't, so I started playing my dad's Strat. And then, uh, yeah, I, I just got into it. This is like uh, same boat, like 97, 98, because um, I'm class of 01. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was class yep. of 99, so I got you by about Yeah, so right years. about there, yeah. And then, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I just didn't, you know, I bought, I wanted to get a good acoustic when I was, so I, I was a junior in high school. I had worked two summers for my dad, uh, saving up to buy what I was convinced was I wanted a Martin. Uh, and I just couldn't find a Martin that I liked. And dad, my dad finally was like, you know, we are like the local music store. He's like, have you heard of this Taylor brand? Maybe you should try those. And I played a 710. This is same boat, like 1998, 99, and mm. uh, uh, just loved it. And so it's, it's actually the most expensive guitar to this day that I've ever actually physically paid for. Um, and I think, you know, I know people, oh, wow. Taylor's kind of polarizing, but that was, to me, a boutique brand, you know, and, and um, <laughs> they're certainly big for boutique now. They're, you know, they're the, the main bar- the other brand now, but the late 90s they were still kind of a yeah you know small thing uh, you know oh yeah absolutely uh, they've never been they've never been my favorite thing for acoustics but that's just me i know that i am an outlier a little bit in that uh i am i i realize that i have boomer taste yeah. guitars and i've just completely <laughs> embraced that i know that 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 i'm a traditionalist and i'm i'm okay with it yep. i've come to grips with it i well, know myself know- I don't hate other guitars, but I know what I like for me. You know, ironically, like I get the Taylor thing, right? They have their own sound. But the reason I didn't like, couldn't find a Martin that I liked, they all played rough to me. They, they, the Taylor and, and whether you like them sonically or not, you cannot fault them for always have building a great guitar that always play great. 
And so it's kind of that always that's that whole you. boutique thing right there. Like, you know, we, we make a living uh, building. I mean, we got kind of known for building a guitar that, you know, was a roadworthy Firebird, and, you know, and now is its own thing. But like it was the guitar that sure. I could put that. I could be the things that they couldn't because I wasn't tied to either history or a bottom line, which God knows I'm still not tied to a bottom line, uh, you know, or what <laughs> making a profit air quotes or running a sustainable business, uh, you know, any of those things like, you know, I, I can make those choices and, and, you know, those guys led the way. And Anderson's another prime example. I did, I had never heard of them until I started dating my wife, uh, in like 2001 and her dad had one. And, uh, and, I, and even then, I didn't quite get it because I was a diehard Strat guy. And, you know, I grew up playing yeah. Strats, and I was like, this isn't I – mean, it's cool. It's just not – I don't – you know, I don't – now I realize how much better it was. But at the time, I was kind of snobby about it. And, and then, uh, you know, so it's – with the boutique thing, it's it's been, you know, interesting in that regards. And, and like, seeing that big shift away and, – and really – having been around long enough to watch people finally start like going through the same journey you went through, like, you know, uh, Oh man, you know, once you get off those four standard choices that everybody has to have at least once, you know, there's just this whole world out there of, of just amazing stuff. There, uh, so it's funny. You mentioned that thing about Martins. Cause I've always sort of had that same thing. It's like, I, they sound yep. great, but it felt like, you had to have your own personal tech to get them to play yeah. right. Um, and I, I'm i going to be slightly controversial. I'm going to say part of it's Martin Strings. <laughs> put it on the, in the stores, Martin's. Look, if you love Martin Strings and you're listening to this podcast, mute for the next like, 20 <laughs> seconds. I, they're, they're terrible. I don't know how they continue to still make yeah. strings. They're so bad. So, But there's that. So what ended up happening to me, like I, I'm, I've I was always a Gibson guy. I, I, I started I started out as a Strat mm-hmm. player. I should say I should. I'm going to backtrack just a little. I started out as a Strat player. My first electric guitar was actually a Jackson yes. Performer Series Two, Floyd Rose two hum, two single coils Solid. and a humbucker. Um, <laughs> I wish I, I shouldn't have sold it, but you know you do that dumb thing when yep. you're a kid. I actually have a reverb search waiting for one in the right finish to pop up. <laughs> I promise I'm going to buy it the moment it pops up. Um, just for nostalgia, gotta have it. Now it's also nice when your nostalgia is still like two or three hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, you know sure. what I mean? So it's, <laughs> if my if my, my nostalgia were a nineteen sixty four Jazzmaster, eh, we might have a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, as far as acoustics, I stumbled across. Uh, so years and years ago, back in the mid two thousands. My sister and I had a band, uh, late 2000s, and she was starting to get a little of attention as a songwriter, performer, um, getting a little bit of label attention. It ended up never working out, which actually I think worked out best because what happened was every time she started to get close to a deal, they started talking about what they wanted to change, and she was like, (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So, you know, I'm proud of her sticking to her guns, but um, we had some folks throw a little money at us. We went and bought guitars, and, like, I was playing bass in that band, and I was already playing a a Five string stingray, sure. and I was like, I'm I'm fine in this, but I don't need another bass. Um, but you know what? I don't have I don't have an acoustic guitar. <laughs> now. And I actually found that's when I discovered mm-hmm. Laravee acoustic guitars, and Martin Sound better playing, in my opinion. I'm gonna get totally lambasted no. on this one, but um, jeans are amazing. So yeah, dude. it's like you start to see the. Oh yeah, no I. I love everything about the way they've done their operation. I think they make incredible yep. guitars at a great price point. Even even with the current the the recent rise in their prices, I think as more people are discovering them, um, uh, they've they've risen them because demand's sure. gotten higher. And but they, they're still making an incredible instrument. Um, I have a Do Five that's essentially, if you want to relate it to something, some Martin D eighteen. Yeah. I think is the model it directly relates to. Killer guitar. So you got this rise in boutique guitar manufacturers, uh, company. I, I hate even calling it companies or manufacturers, makers, because so many of them are just a, a guy in his in his garage yep. or small shop. Yep. I mean, I mean, I look at your Instagram videos and you got your kids putting <laughs> pl- wood planks into a planer and and pulling well, pulling tape on. To be binding. fair, it's less more <laughs> less of a child labor thing and more of a just saving my wife for a couple hours. Uh, <laughs> it's. <laughs> It's worth it. But yeah, I mean, it's, I grew up doing it too. And you know, it's, it's, 
the the thing that's neat about it is besides the creativity, like like okay, back to Larrabee and stuff. I don't think people understand sure. how difficult it is to build a lot of fantastic guitars or even a lot of very good guitars or even a lot of just okay guitars. Like it's when you start moving up to that volume, like it's amazing how hard that can be to do. Like it's easy for me in some regards because I can go, well, I, you know, I don't care if I have to spend an extra hour on something or two hours or five hours. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I care a little bit because I know consciously I got to, you know, you still get we're going to make the same amount of money regardless. Um, so I try to streamline that process, right. but like, you know, the boutique industry has done two things. It's brought a bunch of creativity into it, but it's also forced competition Maybe not really in the direct way that people think, because I'm not, you know, we and we can talk about that in a minute. But like, it's made the big companies up their game. You know, you when we when yes. we first started playing guitar, you know, two hundred dollar import Squire was a terrible guitar, and now a uh, you absolutely know, now a two hundred dollar Squire is a playable instrument, and a five hundred dollar Squire is pretty good, and a eight hundred dollar Epiphone is real good for what it is really you know yeah i've got a i've got an epiphone firebird in the other room in a case that is an incredible yeah. one of the new ones it's an incredible instrument for yeah. 600 yeah and so that's been you know it, you know the funny thing is like with the okay the whole uh you know mark ignisi being held at gunpoint you know we're we're coming for you video yeah <laughs> the, the situation video. i'm like i think you guys don't really understand here because it's easy for them to look at everybody else and go, they're eating our market share. And I'm like, nah, dude, not at all. Not one customer of mine has ever bought a guitar of mine and went, well, I could get this Gibson or I could get this thing. They've already had all yours. They're, they're through it. They, they, yep. you know, this is a, a thing I always have to tell people like who are just starting in the business. Like don't price yourself to compete with them. Don't cause you're not, you just can't like, you're just not going to compete. You're not going to sell that kind of volume. You're not going to sell, you know, the perception's not going to be there. People who buy your stuff, my stuff, you know, the people that are related to me, they've already had custom shop Fender. They've already had a custom shop Gibson or four or five or whatever, you know, the D D 48 uh, or D 24, you know, any, any of those, like, you know, they've had all the, the, the stuff that the dream boat stuff, the stuff that they, you know, and now they're either looking for something different or better or really more than often than not something that the dude at jam night's not going to show up with and have a, you know, he's going to be the only guy there with it or girl there with it. Uh, you know, it, it's, and yeah. so, you know, we, we were competition in regards of making them improve their product, but we're not really market share competition. Like it, you're just, you know, it's the same comparison you can make if, well, also, you know, if you could go drop the coin on a Ferrari, you, Toyota Prius, you know, Toyota's not losing the Prius market <laughs> share to those yeah. people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the guy buying the guy buying a Lambo isn't hurting. Yeah, his yeah, you, you know, know what I mean. <laughs> maybe the GTR a little bit, or you know, other Ferraris a little bit, but most likely yeah. they're going to end up with all of those anyway. So it's it's kind of one of those things. Well, so let's let's talk about how that sort of differentiates because you know, um, somebody first coming to Cower Guitars, I'm going to keep using my favorite yeah. model you make, which yeah. is the Banshee. It's absolutely my favorite. And obviously it is, um, influenced by yeah. the Firebird, which, you know, there's, there's no bones about that. I mean, the banjo tuners alone, it gives yeah. it away, right? That's pretty, pretty unique. But what I love about your guitars and what you were just saying, sort of the creativity that differentiates that first of all, the attention to detail that you can give that they can't, not that they don't want to, not that they don't make you a good product. You just physically can't. But when you're yeah. putting out, when you're putting out that yep. many, you just yep. can't do it. And and I've been to the Gibson factory. Uh, they there are still hands touching guitars. This isn't a completely oh, yeah. automated process. It's just I, people making a lot of guitars. They can't they can't afford to have the strict tolerances that say you can, or for example, I have a Novo yep. uh, Saris J that I absolutely adore. Novo has their no duds policy. I have, I know people who have gotten an email from Novo that said, Hey, your guitar is going to take a week or two longer because the neck that we had for your guitar fell out of our yep. tolerances yeah. and we're not shipping yep. you that neck. And so they're going to start, you're going to get you another neck and fix sure. it and make it right because they have a very strict policy about their tolerances. And you can do yeah. that where, they 
something the, the tolerances have to be the a math lighter. on they look at the math differently you know and you have to i yes. mean and to be fair i mean i do it too and i have to do it right now especially with you know the cost of everything going up and supply side issues and sometimes this is it you know we've been having to use chrome hardware lately because there are no nickel banjo uh, banjo tuners i hate chrome hardware but it's that guitar either gets yeah. done or it sits in our shop waiting for Cluson to get its act together and that hasn't happened yet you know and and uh you know right. so it, it's sometimes that stuff happens but and i have a you know there's we're a seven man shop but or, oh five full time and two part time right now I have three CNCs, I have a laser, I have a Plex machine, I have a UV curing booth. Uh, it's all computerized. I have all the equipment in the world. Building guitars is still a brute force job. Like you just, yep. it helps having that stuff, but it is just endless hours. I was just having this conversation with uh, a friend today, uh, how you know, he's he's got his own business and he's kind of complaining about how, you know, he had a guy that was supposed to come in and start and he just never showed up. And I'm like, yeah, usually that happens. This is to get people all the time. Oh man, I want to come work for you. I want to build guitars. I'm like, it's not that much fun. It's it's just not, you know, it, it's cool at the end, but it's a lot of work in between. And it's just not all that exciting. Oh no, no, no. And then they show up once and they realize it does suck. Uh, that unless you love sanding guitar, standing wood all day, that's right. 90% of building guitars. The fun stuff is, you know, kind of at the beginning and the end. And then there's like three months in the middle. It's just glue up, wait, sand, wait, spray wait sand the spray you know it's just it's endless hand work and uh you know thankfully it's probably what will keep our industry afloat is the fact that you, i mean i guess until star trek yeah until fun. star trek's a thing and you can just ask the computer to replicate it you, you're still gonna have to make these things and anything that's made by people is going to be an interesting and somewhat pricely commodity uh you know and so that's good i guess i don't know i'm pretending to think that yeah. i'm still important yeah, uh, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, you know, in in a, in a way, it it's one of those things where we as guitar players sort of conflate the entire guitar industry in yeah. our heads and think it's this big, big, big entity, and it's like it is so yeah. not. It is so not even close. And so, but so not only can you do attention to detail a little better because you have that margin to do it, but also one of the things, and this is the part that hooked me. This is what kept me is the creativity in what you will do with a sure. guitar where they can't yeah. do that. The big companies, I'm going to even, I'm going to, I'm going to rope fender into this. I'm going to even rope, you know, you can rope even, uh, what's another mid, what I call like a mid major, like a GNL yeah. or something like that. They, there's only so far they can go because their customer base has their preconceived oh, decades old idea of what their yep. guitars are and you don't so you get to do things like two tone red purple sparkle oh, bands yeah and, so you know the funny thing is though and then a baritone yeah, to match we we were in the same trap though so okay like uh besides the construction style of banshee which we'll we'll cycle back to that stuff we you don't sure. see a lot of quilt tops or die and sandback finishes from us or really outside of like Banshee Deluxe, which kind of brought some of that back. Sunburst, you know, you don't see a lot of that. And, but that wasn't the case sure. five years ago or when I first started. When I first started, it was all sunbursts and fancy tops. And then like one day it just switches off. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, everybody wants caddy green Banshees with, with you know, the Scott Holiday look, which is great because – then I don't have to buy fancy wood, uh, you know, or fancy wood. It's all good wood, but, you know, stuff with yeah. fancy figure in it doesn't, you know, like, oh, okay, you just right. want to all mahogany banshee with a solid color. Yeah, yeah, I'll happily do that, uh, you know, and so that'll happen. And then, like, CME will decide, hey, you know, we want to order some stuff that's flashy. Do you want to do some metal flake? Like, yeah, I love doing metal flake. Sure, let's do it. And then that's it. All of a sudden, that's what we're doing a ton of. And, and, you know, and I've had it where we've had a model that we were building a lot and then it just switches off, like not progressively drops. It just went from these are selling great to I've got bodies and necks in the shop that I can't find owners for. Uh, and again, sometimes it can happen that fast. It's so weird. Um, some of that is, I think, evened out as we've been around for so long now. Um, sure. You know, and, and I also tend to like rotate models kind of in and out of what we're making at the time because partially because it 
does it make sense for me to have to try to have 14 models going for a, you know a shop that puts five guitars a week together um uh, you know or seven in a good right. week now um uh, you know and so some of that you know i i kind of manipulate a little bit to control but you know so all of that goes on but the funny thing is for all the stuff we get credit for almost all of it's customer driven like not just like what i think they want like those are literal orders like the, the orange and purple banshee that was a local guy, you know, and yeah. I don't have very many local customers, but That's he crazy. came in and inspected both those out. And I was like, okay, if you, <laughs> I mean, your credit card cleared and it's if on the order form, so. so we're doing it. And I was kind of nervous because, you know, doing a two-tone, two different metal flakes was a first for me because, I, you know, stuff goes everywhere. So I was, you know, and it's yeah. hard to tape it because it's, it's not smooth until you get near the end of the process and you don't want to do all that and then try to clear the next section and then even it all. But it actually, they came out great, and and I was real excited to see how they would go down on Instagram this week because, like, those are love or hate. Those were bold choices. They're they're not subtle at all. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, they're no. That's a that's a that's a design oh, statement. Man. Absolutely. With, the best doubt. was so uh, listener. If you haven't checked it, go look at those. Uh, yeah, they're they're, they're, they're like incredible. literally purple on the wings and orange flake on the center, and vice versa. I texted them the the owner of those two. Uh, we were at, uh, you know, shopping for shoes for my eight, nine year old, uh, the other day at, at Vans and Vans had a pair of purple and orange, you know, slip ons or whatever the classics in the, I mean, like even the right shades of orange and purple. I was like, and I texted like, dude, you better <laughs> tell me what your shoe size is. And he just didn't get back to me in time. I'm like, I'm going to have to buy those for you. Like they are, they were, <laughs> it was yeah ridiculous. You gotta have them. Yeah. You gotta have them. To we match. we get a lot of credit it's... for stuff that, like I said, is customer driven. Though there have been ones. Um, I don't know if you saw the Mister Sparkles Corona. Uh, that was a customer idea. Like he, it was a good repeat customer of mine. He's like, I want a Mister Sparkles theme guitar, and I'm like, done. I say no more. You get no <laughs> input beyond this point. Uh, you know, and that one came out outrageous. It was so cool. Uh, and then at the same time, we had. Two other guitars, two different customers within a week of each other order um, Star Wars themed guitars. We had an R2-D2 and uh, um, the other one was the Millennium Falcon uh, theme. No, what was the other? Or were oh, they both wow. R2-D2s? I, you know, one, was, like, one was a Corona and one was a Banshee. Um, and like I went crazy on the Corona. Like, it, like it, yeah, it was Millennium Falcon. That's right. <laughs> so it had uh, – no, 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 no. Okay, now I remember what it was. It's ridiculous. I got an email. I want to order a Corona. I want it to look like Han Solo's pants. And I had to Google that because I didn't know that was a specific, <laughs> like, I like Star Wars, but not that level of nerdy. Like, I like I didn't right. know that was a thing. Like, it's blue with the red stripes that are kind of uh, not, not like a solid stripe, but like an interrupted stripe pattern. And uh, it was cool. It came out cool. So we did those. And then, like, I had, I was like, well, I mean, you can't have Star Wars. The best part of Star Wars uh, to me, and best part of anything, it's always, but like the ship, right? Like Star Trek, same thing, the ship. Right. And I want the console. And you could tell Star Wars was all made with like surplus, you know, large plastic, very clearly late seventies buttons that do everything. And so yep. like, I got like, you know, old school light up buttons for each pickup to turn the pickups on. And <laughs> we use sliders. in like a, like a, like a console, like a fader console, uh, instead of volume knobs. So that look, and then we use like a, a uh, like the Telecaster switch tips, which were, you know, the, the barrel style. So they look like the throttles on the Millennium Falcon right. when you ran them up and down. And oh. yeah, it was cool. Like I, that one I could do a lot I'm gonna more. I'm going to have to find this one. Uh, I figured if you didn't like it, it was most of it was on a pick guard that we could replace uh, and, and, and do a more traditional oh, sure. pick guard, but loves it. Uh, so that stuff is kind of fun when I get a, I want to do this and then you just run with it. And, and, Ironically, the downside to being as busy as we've been the last, like we're we're probably realistically we have work on the books scheduled for two years from now, uh, which is insane. Wow, uh, we've never been that busy. But like the downside is, a lot of it's the you know a little bit more conservative dealer work or repetitive work for our guitar center and stuff, which is great. But I'm like, I gotta sneak in something that's weird here from time to time, just because otherwise. It does become a repetitive job of like, oh, good, it's another caddy green banshee. Okay, you know, whatever. Uh, okay, uh, so when we get to do these weird ones, and we've done so many, and, and you, don't get, you get that creative input instead of just yeah. It, it, you got to yeah, have that out. You know, and that's that's what keeps it fun and interesting. And like, because like, 
I do all the design, like all the models are my designs. Um, you know, I obviously I do all things in the shop. I mainly paint and do the computer design work and stuff. Those are like the two areas that I mostly do, but I also, you know, whoever short that day or like today I was, you know, bandsaw and fretboards, getting ready to run a whole stack of fretboards and stuff. But that's kind of my main thing. And like, uh, I haven't done a lot of design lately because I'm going to kind of a, I like what we're making. I have some, st like the electro liner, like our strategy models just kind of coming out. That's the newest thing. Um, but we've been doing so much charity work with the Corona model. Uh, and those are builders. I was going to want to yeah, bring that up next. And so yeah. usually when we do those, I kind of like, well, they're technically builder's choice. But especially this last round where we did 20 of them. I don't want to make 20. I don't want to decide right. 20 of them. So like some of them like, you know, like, hey, if you roughly have a pickup layout, maybe a color that you would be super thrilled with if it happened to be that color tell me and then so some of those right. i still got like just do whatever you want so i, I if i can whittle 20 i like being creative 20 is a lot a few is fine <laughs> you know right. and, and so we we've i've got a few of those that we're having fun with right now and and also like we get to pick some you know kind of off menu colors i got a uh our paint supplier sent us the wrong can of paint i like i i used it uh it was it's some lamborghini color and, and it's kind of like <laughs> it's it's like a almost like burgundy mist but not quite and so i was like hey, you know, like i'm not sending it back you build me for it. i'm keeping the can uh but you probably should figure out which customer you meant to send that to uh, so there's a donation corona in that color now um you know and then like i've done some stuff with other things in the last couple of weeks it'll be fun uh but yeah it's and the mr sparkles was a was a donation guitar actually uh which i went way beyond yep. and above for but again it was a good cause and a good customer so so I want to talk about the, the donation guitars mm -hmm. because I I was actually telling my wife about this concept and how much I absolutely love the way you did it because, you know, a lot of people do charity thing and raising money for, like, for example, I give my Patreon to great. charity this year. It'll be my, This is my first year of the podcast, so this is my first charity I'm going to give to next year. I'm going sure. to look for a different charity. Every year I'm going to try to find something new. Um, St. Jude was an easy one because yep. I, you know, live in Mississippi. It's right in Memphis, and I've always raised money for them. I've run the St. Sure. Jude Marathon twice now, um, which, by the way, it, it, if one of the greatest experiences of my life is at St. Jude Marathon, but it, it's rude. <laughs> like, that entire route is so rude. Mile six through, like, seven and a half actually uh. runs through the campus of St. Jude. Do you know how hard when they what they do is all the kids that can come down to the sidewalk and cheer you on? Do you know how hard it is to run while you are crying <laughs> in a mass of people? It's well, impossible. All, all it scenarios is the me, rudest thing me ever. Involve me also crying. So yeah, I actually do understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> so but these the, the Corona models, which we should mention, is it's not just a reference to, to Corona. It's it's the model's mm -hmm. name. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to make sure I get this right. So correct me if I get it wrong. The idea is that, um, people put down their deposits, $500 deposit. They make a $500 donation to their own local food sure. bank that they can find, show you proof of that donation. And then that's now half the price of the guitar covered. So, and so it's now, a so I've done it a couple different right? ways. Uh, that's how we did it okay. one way. Uh, well, okay. Let me, mm -hmm. let me go back here. So. Corona came out, um, there's a longer history to it, but essentially last summer was when the first ones started coming off the bench. And a lot happened last summer. Uh, a lot Hold happened on. in the last year and a half, but uh, right around the time that that was coming out, uh, <laughs> and we kind of jokingly called it Corona, and so this kind of whole thing kind of evolved at the same time. Uh, you know, the George Floyd thing happened, and we just kind of it's hard this is a hard line for me to walk because i don't want to come off the wrong way or you know doing this stuff but sure. you know i wanted to do something to help and i had the first corona that went together and i put it out there i was like i'll make a deal i'm gonna if someone shows me a two thousand dollar donation receipt to you know aclu and double or whatever um this guitar is theirs i don't want to see it i don't want it to come through me I don't want I don't want any of it because I don't right. sometimes I feel a little hanky when places are like, you know, oh, we there is every pair of these socks you buy. We give them to the homeless, which hopefully you're not sponsored yeah. by uh, Bombas. But, uh, you know, we're like I, I like do you, <laughs> no. do you really do that or do we just hope you like. So this was like, I don't want to see a penny of it. You just show me the receipt. 
And that guitar, uh, I'm going to use the quotes, air quotes again, sold within, you know, obviously, uh, within like three minutes. Like it was mm-hmm. gone. Uh, and so then I was like, that's well, amazing. I'll do three more spots. Same way. Builder's Choice, $2,000 receipt. We'll do it. And those spots disappeared immediately. Uh, and so then I was kind of like, this was May ish, June, right? So I think we might have just come out of shelter and place at the shop, but I don't think so. I think we were still. I think I was literally by myself still while everybody else was on PPP. I couldn't say no. Like it was real hard. Like I had to try to find a balance for like how much can I think I can afford to give away here and actually accomplish and get done. And I think we ended up doing like 14 that first time. And then we've done it a few different ways. One time we did do it like Thanksgiving, $500 to a food bank, $500 to us, gets you on the board. Um, And then we did like a special kind of like a satin open grain version for 2000 on that. And that went really well. Um, we've done, uh, end of the year, I kind of do a similar thing where we do a raffle, you know, I'll pull something either I built or from my personal stash and we'll do purely food banks at, you know, Thanksgiving, um, and Christmas. And so we raised money through that last year. Um, and then the trick is kind of like, I, I have to balance a couple things. If we do this too often, you lose kind of the, the ability to kind of hit something hard that you want to, that I'm passionate about, uh, and really fundraise. Right. And also, you know, I, as much as I would love to just do this for free and give everything away, I, you know, I have to be cognizant about how much we can accomplish and afford to accomplish. Um, so we kind of, after Christmas, we hadn't done much. Um, and then, uh, the last one, uh, was a month, two months ago with, uh, af- you know, the ending of Afghanistan. Right. Um, we kind of tagged on to another, uh, person's fund GoFundMe that was funding, you know, uh, PMCs to airlift people out. Um, so we, you know, they don't know we did that. We didn't, we just, I, I like, it's a, I guess a, a people person that I follow who I've contributed to their other fundraisers before. I liked what he was doing. Um, so we put it out there, you know, 2000 bucks of that or 2000 bucks to world central kitchen, which was my, my personal favorite that we always re- no matter what's going on, that's always an option that you can support. Um, and we had to shut that one off at like, I think 24 spots. Like that was like, I, I couldn't say wow. no. And, you know, and then we also ran like, a, a at simultaneously, I pulled a guitar from my stash and then, and then opened up, uh, I had a friend of ours who, a family friend of mine who did a $2,000 donation and then donated their spot to a, to the raffle, uh, for small donations. And so between collectively since last i guess may when we started doing this we've done we raised a hundred thousand dollars uh which has been staggering to me uh i'm, I'm almost more, I, I think i'm actually more proud of that than anything we've actually built or done that that's a staggering amount of what i hope is good and goodwill put back into the universe uh, and we're using a guitar that you know the corona name kind of was started as a joke because we <laughs> it, it's got a little bit more history it's based on a guitar that we used to make called the KR one. Uh, so Corona was kind of a good fit, Mm -hmm. you know, the Corona with a K and also it's, it's our Telecaster. So it's an homage to, you know, tele fender in Corona, California, California. you know, and, but it's also built during the time of Corona and, you know, in COVID. And so if we can put money into the universe and, and help bring some good with that guitar, um, that's a big deal for us. Like it's a, it, it, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm a I'm a big karma guy, and and not that I'm doing this for karma, but I like. I don't know. It, it feels like it's this is gonna stray again in the territory. Uh, a lot of people can sit around and complain about what's going on. I don't have a lot of direct impact on affecting the world, but this is one way I can do it, and I'm it it makes me feel very happy to do that. Um, so we and you know and, and that makes uh, go ahead. It makes a ton of sense, though. It's a great way to. It's it's building community. It builds. I, I think it does everything. It, it builds up those who need it. it, it as long as you know money's going yeah. the right way, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but, <laughs> but I don't know. No, uh, I'm sure know, they're all. Those are I'm sure above no, you're board. Okay. You're but yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't. I genuinely don't know. Uh, and you know, a lot of lot of charities do come under flack at some point or another. Um, you know, it, we'll, we'll get away from yeah. all that because I'll get myself in trouble calling people out and I'm, I'm not a name caller. We're not going to do that, <laughs> but 
it it builds it builds community yeah. though, and it's it's putting money in the hands of the right places and those who can should. I'm, I've always been a big believer of that. Whether that is uh, your your time, your money, or whatever it is you can give to help those who yeah. need. I'm a big believer in building in your own community first. Um, I actually talked with uh, Jason Mays from Working Class Music on our sure. Patreon episode a couple of weeks ago. That was a really <laughs> long one. We got on a real, real long conversation on comic books there and superheroes go. and movies. And and my favorite, my favorite comic book uh, superhero of all time is sure. Daredevil. Always has been. I love Daredevil. Has zero to do with his abilities or his superpowers or anything about him, except that I loved his philosophy. Um, that in the comics, if, if you read the comics, not everyone reads the comics, and I'm I'm woefully behind. I found out <laughs> while talking to Jason because I I basically haven't read anything that's come out since 2000, and I really need to get caught up. But um, at any point. Daredevil had the ability to say join the Avengers if he had wanted sure. to, you know what I mean, and go on and solve the universe's problems, but he didn't. He stayed in Hell's Kitchen and fixed his neighborhood. Yeah. You know, like he fixed his community. Sure. He did what he could. He's not out there making the big impact of say the Spider-Man and the Fantastic yep. Four. I cannot believe I'm going this far with this <laughs> Marvel analogy, but I'm going to. Damn it, I'm going here. So, you know, he could have done that, but he didn't. He stayed. He said, I can affect change yeah. here, and this is where it needs it. And, you know, if that means all you do is go down and volunteer once a month at the animal shelter to just play with sure. dogs, and you know what I mean? If that's the, what you have to give, that makes yep. a difference somewhere down the line. And I think it's really cool to see people giving back instrument makers – um, pedal makers, yeah. actually, whoever it is in the industry, I love to see it going you know, that's, in some way, shape, I mean, or form. Uh, two notes in that regard, but one back in the summer when all it started, I mean, you you know, Chase Bliss, all the pedal guys did stuff that was similar, you know, yeah. and it's kind of this going to sound like a real jerk move. We didn't see that at the level that could afford to do that more than we could, and so I'm going to hold that You're one right. real proud to us. And you know, and the other thing too is like. Okay, uh, two more points on that regard. One, that. Two, uh, we got introduced. I, you know, it's I, especially in that first couple of days, it was like drinking from a fire hose. Like, you know, we were because of it, you know, I like I knew the big staples for charities and stuff, but like we found a lot of great direct local, you know, people would say, hey, I want to donate to this. Does it pass muster? And I'd look at, yeah, it looks great. Let's do it. You know, and so we, we ended up doing stuff for like, uh, Institute for Justice, which turned out to have one of my customers is one of their lawyers and they're, you know, arguing Supreme Court cases oh, and, wow. and stuff. And so, uh, you know, that was really cool. And, and uh, you know, that made me real happy. And, you know, I kind of look at it like, I mean, I grew up like, you know, because the town Elk Grove that we lived in was a lot smaller back then. You know, my mom, my mom was involved in the, like the county fairs art exhibits. Like she ran that, like, you know, my, and if the schools ever need anything, you know, they were involved by the, the shop programs in when we still have shop programs, which we still thankfully have in, in our school district at a few schools. That's some of amazing. our, a lot of our old equipment went there, you know, it was, we would upsize in a new equipment, wow. you know, they would end up with it. So I've always kind of been proud of that Avenue and like, uh, you know, I, I have the most ridiculous way on earth to make a living. And I have people who work for me, Somehow that I can pay them to do that. Uh, and I get to make Simpsons jokes and dick jokes online. And people still somehow take me serious enough to buy a $4,000 guitar. Uh, you know, I, I I feel like that's amazing that I get to do that. And I also get to do that because of the, you know, I have charity of my wife and my family who lives with me letting me do that. So I, it's real important. It's become a really important thing. Uh, and to finally be in a position where we could do that, uh, you know, three, four years ago, we probably, we couldn't do what we're doing now, um, at that scale, you know, we could do something, you know, a small amount, but to be able to, you know, do as much as we have in the last year has been really, uh, amazing. So it's, it's been important to me for, to, to give back like that. Um, uh, it makes it me sound very douchey to be honest, but it's, 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 it's been really good. You know, and again, the selfish part of me is like, oh, man, 
I get to build some stuff that I want to build. And if you don't like it, get your money back from charity because I didn't take a penny of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we're going to, we're going to talk about design. We're going to talk about some design aspects in the, the Patreon episode here in sure. just a little bit as we start to wrap up. But I, I will here on this episode, I'll shout out one of my patrons, uh, Kyle and I were talking about your guitars in fact, he and I very commonly just send each other pictures of whatever y'all put out on Instagram or, or one of us has gone like way down the rabbit hole and we're like a year and a half mm-hmm. ago of your posts. Sure. And it's like, have you seen, like, there was one that you, you did actually, um, even my wife pointed it out. It's the, the green with pinstripe and yeah. the filter trons, the three yeah. filter trons. I'm not even a great <laughs> fan, but like, it's like that weird combination of like, to me, like Gretchen, some of those aesthetics that are obviously throwbacks yep. to that style only work on like a hot, hollow body or a semi hollow. No, no, that yeah. guitar was hot. Oh, was I'm just... a, I am <laughs> no, a. That was all there was. I, I'm not a very religious man, but I definitely pay, uh, pray towards Saint Gretch. Uh, if if Gretch does a color <laughs> scheme, it is the correct color scheme. If they put gold hardware on a color. That is the correct choice. You do not mess with that. <laughs> that yeah, is the way it's they, supposed they, to go. I mean, a, a 6120 is a 6120, and, and I have things that we build that I'd rather have instead. But they don't get that part wrong. Uh, a White Falcon is a ridiculously yeah. cool guitar to this day. You know? it, it, I'm not a Gretsch <laughs> player. I, I know that about yeah. myself. I've, I've had a Gretsch, and I've played a, I've played a whole bunch of vintage Gretsches. Yep. Um, cause the shop that I used to hang out in Clarkstone, Mississippi had a bunch of Gretches sure. come through and the, the owner, the owner was a big time, like birds uh-huh. and beetles and, and all that kind of stuff fan. And he had a 60, uh, no, 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 no. He had a Tennessean sure. that he rebuilt almost from parts, a, a 60 some odd. Anyway, I'm going to digress, but they're not my yeah. thing, but a white Falcon is maybe the coolest guitar yeah. ever I- made. It's just so I cool. I very rarely trade for guitars, but I do have a standing if someone has an ocean turquoise uh, custom shop penguin with the sparkle binding, you know, gold sparkle binding. Ocean turquoise specifically, though. Uh, preferably yes. with Powertrons, not Dynasonics, but I can swap those. That's a free trade for whatever they want from the Cowher lineup. That's one of the very few things that's in, like, like wow. not a vintage, like, a, like a, just a current production that I would trade yeah. for in a heartbeat. You know, there might be <laughs> a trade with a friend of mine for his black penguin. That's close. I can, I can live with that. Uh, that's in the works, yeah. but he's also a good friend and customer, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah. No, I, I, I'm with you. Like we, and we make, that's the thing. Like yeah, with Banshee, no. especially like if you really look at Ban, like I always have this conversation with new dealers. Don't order a sunburst Banshee with Firebird minis. That's a total waste of time. You know, we don't make, we, we very rarely sell, you know, we maybe get a request for that literally once every five years, you know, w- do the caddy green with power trots, do the, the Scott holiday layout, do a white Falcon Banshee, do a, you know, do a, a, a deluxe with a maple top and a cherry burst and humbuckers. Those will sell no problem. Cause you're, you know, the one, if you're going to, that's the same competing against Gibson thing, but like, you don't need yeah. to like, no, first of all, Firebirds kind of suck Sonic. Like they're they are a very specific sound, and you either like it or don't. It's a big Telecaster. It does not sound like an Explorer. Uh, you know, we build a bitch nope. Banshee that sounds like an Explorer, and we saw a lot of them. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, and see, that's what Kyle and I were talking about. It is that um, because I, I I'm in a it's sort of pausing right now, but I'm in sort of a gear like. I'm having one of those moments of gear because I am not yeah. a collector and I realized that I had gotten to like a collection <laughs> of guitars and I was like, this doesn't work sure. for me. Like I don't touch these guitars and some of them are good guitars. Some of them are great guitars, yeah. but I would rather have, uh, and the number fluctuates a lot, but I'd rather have three or four amazing yeah. guitars and one of those things that I love, um, that I discovered I love, is that body style, like mm-hmm. your your banshee. And I love that body style. So, like your guitars are on like my short list of like I and I got to so during summer Nam went to sure. Nashville, hung out, got to hang out with Kevin Equitz at his Kevin. house. He hosted a whole bunch of folks. Kevin's a yep. great guy. Got to play a ton of guitars, and he had a cower, and that's yep. the first time I got to play a cower. 
And I was like, Kevin, I love your guitar. <laughs> this, this is <laughs> this is a thing. And so now it's it's on my list. And actually, I, long before I wanted to get you on the episode, we we've already talked a couple about sure. guitars. I'm, I'm gonna order one. Just gotta yeah. move some things. Um, but Kyle and I were talking, and we said I'm gonna have to just sort of tell you, okay, I know I don't yeah. want this. Other than that, help yep. me because I am such a traditionalist. Like in my head, it is hard for me to break that sunburst with yep. mini humbuckers yep. thing. You know what I mean? And what a waste it would be to order just yeah. a Firebird. Yep. You know what I mean? When you're you allow too many options. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you don't, but you allow yeah, too many options. True. Uh, you know, it's, and I have, it's, uh, I have, it's, oper- I have paralysis when yeah. it comes to that. It's, a- yeah, you know, we, we, we have, uh, I mean, like I have all the standard colors and stuff, but it, you know, we, sure. Chris Benson from Benson amps, his banshee, we match his Astro van. Like, because we, so he asked, and I was like, "Sure, dude. Tell me the year, the name of the color, and I'll do it." And uh, we found the color, and you know, and 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 actually, I reused that color the other day. I had to kind of blend a, uh, the the Starliner we posted that had like the uh, we called it the guy in burst. It was that Star Trekky themed one. That's that blue is oh, yeah. mostly his color. It's it started as that, and then like <laughs> you know, it's been in the paint locker for I don't know seven years now or something. I finally got to use the next ten percent of the can, but yeah, you know, I. The funny thing with Banshee for me is I actually very rarely have a Banshee for myself. Uh, I I built them before the business. You know, it was one of the guitars I learned how to make, truly build scratch guitars from scratch. You know, I was doing everything on it. Um, and then I had, uh, I always got kind of talked out of them by people, whatever one I might, might have had at the time. And it was fine because it's not my, it wasn't my, I had to go through kind of that same arc. Like I had one with Firebird Minis and I had one with P90s and I had one with, full size humbuckers and they were all three pickup ones because they look super cool. And then I finally had to admit, I don't like them. I, I, you know, I like the two pickup more. The threes look the coolest. The one sounds the best and the two is the one I'm going to play the most. Uh, You know, and, and then, so I didn't have one for a long time. And then I had one that got broken um, in shipping and we built a new guitar for the guy and I repaired it and I ended up keeping it for myself because we wouldn't sell it at that point. And I really loved that guitar. Uh, And then it got broken again um, going to summer Nam uh, a few years back. Uh, so I actually, um, I don't know, hopefully, uh, heritage doesn't listen to this, not heritage, uh, my insurance company. I got paid twice on that guitar. Um, <laughs> that was okay. Uh, you know, it was, you know, but, uh, uh, and so I didn't have one again for a long time. And then we started doing the banshees with the maple top and that guitar is very different than I expected it to be. I did not expect it to be sonically that different. Cause it's, you know, uh, it's only a quarter inch top and it's only in the center, uh, cause the wings are milled down right. and it's a neck through. And I thought, I, I don't think this one's going to shift all that much. And it really changes that guitar more than adding a top really? to anything else we make does like that one changed drastically. And I played the first one. It had full size humbuckers and a cherry burst and went, that's the one, that's the one I will keep. Um, though I ultimately I ended up keeping a tobacco burst, uh, that went to guitar player review. Um, that guitar, that changed Banshee for me, for me, you know, like eh, that. And wow. it's the same boat. Like, you know, I'm still kind of a traditionalist. Like I have three super chiefs. Um, but my humbucker one yeah. is my favorite is, I think still like my, I have the Nam one that's seafoam green with, uh, the, you know, white Falcon binding. It's the prettiest one. Um, I still like the humbucker one just slightly more. Um, though the Powertrons are kind of my like when I have people are like I kind of want a P90, but I kind of want a humbucker. I'm like Powertrons, like that's where you want to be, and they sound uh, they're my favorite pickup uh, for almost any situation. But I do find myself kind of gravitating towards that. Uh, I have a Corona. I have one of the I have the first Pine Corona um, or Thermal Pine Corona, and. Uh, it's exactly the same pickup layout as my KR1, uh, which is the same guitar, but basswood instead of uh, uh, pine. And I played that one and went, no, I'm going to keep this one too. I need this one. Uh, I already have almost this guitar. I need this one. <laughs> um, and I'm not a Telecaster guy. Like, I hate Telecasters. Uh, oh, I hate it's a strong word. I don't like a Blackguard 50s ash-bodied 
that that I don't like that sound. It does not work for me. I am probably right. too crappy of a guitar player to get away with that thing. Um, <laughs> the Pine does all the Telecaster stuff, but it kind of fills the mid range back out. And now you're Keith Richards, which I know ironically he plays a Blackguard, but in my mind you're a rock and yeah. roll Telecaster. That's that's perfect for me. That's what I want. Uh, so I have that, you know. But I, I and I have a handful of things but i yeah my my personal tastes tend to be in a little bit more in that traditional camp and you know uh that's why i have three super cheaps i mean i I big semi hollows are my thing and and uh um you know those are phenomenal and yeah exactly yeah i honestly i have i would have a fourth super cheap if i didn't feel guilty about it you know i i don't know what it would be but i i would have another (laughs) one in a heartbeat um you know i have the 12 string and the and the the white you know or the sea foam and the the red one um uh, you know i i uh like you know ironically of everything i own though i still think the best sounding guitar that i own that i have kept uh that i will be buried with uh is my starliner carve top and it's the neck angle is too low uh the bridge is sitting right on the body but the action is perfect for me the neck is too thin for my taste normally i don't like that neck i love this one yeah. Everything about that that guitar is, to this day, the best sounding guitar I think we have ever built. Like it is a, like we, I, wow. I, I, I try to aim for. This is where I hold my pickup winders to. Like that's why we use TV Jones, Lawler, and Wolf Tone, like pretty much exclusively. Uh, I try to hold everything to plus or minus five percent. That's I think a pretty tight tolerance for like where a guitar sits sonically. And if we can hit really between like down to and up to where no one on earth would know unless you played 60 of them in a row. Like that's, that's the range we want to be in. But occasionally you get that one that just, they all stack, you know, Wolf had his Wheaties that morning, uh, you know, or whatever <laughs> the sun was at the right. I, I don't know what it is, but one will just stack up slightly better than the rest. That's my Starliner. That guitar just slays. And it's the only guitar in my collection of stuff that I've built that predates the Plex that I haven't put on the plaque. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to, I, I wow. just, I don't want it to sit exactly like it stays. I, I'm not messing with it. It would probably improve with the plaque. Nothing has not improved with the plaque. Sure. That one I'm superstitious about. I don't want to touch it. Uh, it's that good. I'm, I'm okay with superstition. Yeah. I'm, I'm a baseball <laughs> fan. So superstition's a thing. So with, we're going we're gonna to wrap sure. up here. We're going to go on over to the Patreon episode. Listeners, I want to thank you all for listening and hanging out with us and talking guitars and getting really nerdy. And uh, I sure hope you'll go over to uh, 40wattpodcast.com, go over to patreon.com slash 40wattpodcast, go over to Cower Guitars, check them out on Instagram and on the website. You'll find all their information down in the show notes. Um, you can find that either um, – in your podcast player or on YouTube, if you happen to be watching this, or it's also, if I get my act together, going to be on the website. So you can (laughs) find the post there. Um, In the meantime, um, if you want to catch the second half of the episode and aren't a Patreon, remember to go over and do that $5 a month. If not, we'll catch you next week. And in the meantime, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other and try to make some noise.